Poltergeist visual effects, Harlan Ellison, MST3K, the movie, and a virtual artist next on The Buzz. They may have pulled the plug on the TV series, but Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, has arrived. Breaking the boundaries of traditional art with virtual art. It's Back to the Future with Rocky Jones Space Ranger. Harlan Ellison thinks the names of award winners should not be kept secret. And creating the gruesome ghost for the new TV series, Poltergeist, The Legacy. They said, it must not happen. Sci-fi is sacred. Having fun with science fiction should not be allowed. Whoever said that was proven wrong. Look at Mystery Science Theater 3000. Sci-fi buzz. Third rock from the sun. How about Tim Burton's newest movie, Mars Attacks? Or MST3K, The Movie? When will having fun with science fiction ever end? Hopefully never. Hey, come to think about it, I don't believe you bowed down before me recently. Uh, sure we have, last week. No, 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 I think that was more of a curtsy than a bow. Last December, Comedy Central pulled the plug on Mystery Science Theater 3000. For fans, the silver lining on that dark cloud is that Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, premieres this month. So hapless Mike Nelson is still being held hostage in space and has been forced to watch one more hideous movie with his wise-cracking robot pals. I command you, stand back. Acting. <laughs> well, that seemed to go rather well. I don't see what could possibly go wrong. <laughs> to get the inside dope on MST3K, the movie, I hunted down the stars, Mike Nelson, Crow T. Robot, and Tom Servo. Compare the movie to the TV show. Compare and contrast to the TV show. One of these things is not like the other. Uh, the TV show, I mean... God love it. It's a great show. Mm -hmm. But, oh. but it's, it's a glorified Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a good Fran. show. Guess it's, who's Fran. It's one of my favorite shows, it's but they tiny. just point the camera and go. I mean, this is a motion it's, picture. Look at your movie. The camera's... It's got scope. It's moving. It's, it's got there's vista. Explosions. If the, if the bus goes under 50 miles an hour, it explodes. I mean, mm. that's what this ah, whole thing ah. is about. Hey, oh. hey, Mike, you hit something. The Hubble. You killed the Hubble. I'd heard the jump to the big screen brought a jump in the size of the special effects budget. So I asked the boys just how special those effects are. Oh, oh yes. Special? Are you kidding? Yeah. Very, very That's like saying Bob Hope and special. You know, they, they, <laughs> you see the strings, you see the wire, you know, they're just... But they're extra special. Yeah. They're, they're, there are yeah. kind of special effects. You've heard of industrial light and magic? Yes. They did not work on this film. Nothing doing. But they, Industrial plumbing but they do exist. On this film, I think. <laughs> Rumors have been flying that, just like Fatal Attraction, the ending of this film was reshot. Mike and the bots confirmed the rumor. And Satisfied with the way things were going, okay? Pretty much. I saw the way that Mike had uh, arranged the ending of the film, and I kind of thought it sucked. Servo so <laughs> got killed at the end. He and then now we have him coming well, out of the bathtub. What kind of ending is yeah. that? <laughs> I mean, he springs back out. Ooh, scary. <laughs> and then, you know. He's never quite dead. And another juicy rumor about this project is also true that the mystery science gang nixed an offer to make this film with Paramount because the studio wanted too much control. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do, fire me, put Kirk Cameron in there. Pretty much. You know, and we said yes. We like Kirk, <laughs> yes. but Mike yeah. just wouldn't have it for some reason. You know, he got a big <laughs> bug up his behind about that. I guess everybody knows now that the TV show was canceled. Whose fault was it? Who takes responsibility for that? That was me. Yeah, I did much it. Much crow. What yep. happened? Why? I unplugged it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, he kicked the plug out. I now we don't out. have a show. Yes. yes, but they do have a motion picture. Of course, that puts these guys in an ironic situation. Now a movie audience can talk back to them, just as they've done to so many abominable films. Do they think that might happen? Uh, no, because we do it too quick. They can't get their comments in because ours are in there, and they're way funnier than you could ever be in your whole life, so don't even try it. Next, a virtual artist searches for respect in the art world, and Harlan Ellison's commentary. Stand by.
Ocean Township, New Jersey, and I'm calling to recommend a great new comic magazine called Conan the Savage. It's about uh, everyone's favorite barbarian hero. It is uh, the new reworked version of uh, the old Conan, Savage sort of Conan magazine. And uh, beautiful artwork, excellent storylines, and uh, it's fun for pretty much all ages. We want you to be a part of this show. Simply Here. Dine. Simply. Harlan Ellison. You know, every week I come out here, sometimes I wear clothing, sometimes I don't, and I usually have something to kvetch about. I have something to argue about or something to yell about, and everybody gets nasty with me, and they get cranky with me, and they say, oh, what a curmudgeon. But, you know, sometimes I just feel good, and I don't really want to bash anybody. I don't want to diss anybody. I don't want to, like, you know, pretend to be Bob Dole holding onto his pen. I, I, I want to be a nice guy, but I can't because the world is so filled with doofuses and gazoonies that it's very difficult. Let me give you a for instance. Every year, at every convention where they give an award, whether it's the HWA, the Horror Writers Association can, uh, a banquet, where they, where they give out the, uh, the Usher Houses, which we call the Bram Stoker Awards, or it's the World Science Fiction Convention where they give out the, uh, uh, the, the Oscar of the SF World, which is, which is called the Hugo, or SFFWA, where they give out the Nebula Awards, they all maintain secrecy. World Fantasy Convention maintains secrecy. You cannot find out who won any of the categories. And that means that often there's nobody there to accept the awards. For instance, look, see back there? See right behind me there? That is a painting by Jacek Yurka. I did this book, Mind Fields, with the paintings of Jacek Yurka. Jacek Yurka lives in Poland, and he won the World Fantasy Award for the Most Outstanding Artist. Did they tell anyone? No! So Jacek was not there, nor was his publisher, Jim Cowan of Morpheus, nor was anyone else there who could accept this and say a few words on his behalf. No one bothered to get in touch with Jacek and say, hey, you've won. The man's in, you get it, Poland. We're talking here, Poland. Nobody bothered to tell him. They play this stuff with such incredible, vainglorious hubris, like these itty-bitty, pishy little awards were the Oscars. Like somebody really gives a hoot, like someone is gonna be very upset if the winners are revealed ahead of time. Please, folks, this is all ego. It is silliness. It's the maintaining of a, of, of a secrecy, which is idiocy. If the people have won, let them know. Let them attend if they want to, so they can be there to pick up the award. People say, well, if we see them in the audience, we'll know they won. So what? So what if you know they won? What's the big damn deal? And this goes on and on every year. This, this ridiculous amateurism in which people who give out awards think that their awards are the end all and the be all, that you must climb the northern face of Annapurna to get the damn award. No, all you have to do is go someplace like Eugene, Oregon, or to New Orleans and be there which would be very nice for the people who've paid all that money and gone to the convention and have gone to this big banquet and paid all the money to see the awards won. So please, would you mind? Knock off this secret ballot crap, you know? I mean, once they've won, they've won. Send out the word, let them know, tell them, look, keep it to yourself. If we'd like, you know, we'd like to be a surprise, that's fine, but tell the people so they can get their awards. Uh-huh, now you see, I didn't want to have to get mean with you. I didn't, I didn't want to say anything bad to you, but you people just won't leave me alone. You won't act like adults. What am I to do? Now, Susan, when you say that Jennifer Steinkamp is a virtual artist, you're shortchanging her. It sounds like she's not really an artist. Right. She's not virtually an artist. She is a virtual artist, meaning her work draws you into this immersive experience. Oh. 3D animation. It's incredible So you're talking stuff. about CG systems that visual effects houses use. It's like uh, silicon graphics. It's, that's what I said. <laughs> Jennifer Steinkamp is a faculty member in the Computer Graphics Department at the Art Center College of Design located in Pasadena, California. There she teaches students how to manipulate 3D animation software so they can pursue careers in the burgeoning computer animation field. But her spare moments are spent creating abstract 3D images for her other career as a virtual artist. I've always had it in the back of my mind to to use computer animation in art, fine art. And it did take a while to kind of establish that. I actually went back to school for my master's degree here while I was teaching. And um, 
started developed this form where I'm projecting uh, computer animation within architecture, and it's always specific to the, the space. For instance, one of my earlier pieces, there was uh, this interesting skylight in the museum, and we put a, a screen over the skylight and projected onto it. So what what occurred was you're looking up at a ceiling that was then animating. It was sort of this abstract, uh, it was actually sort of a Rorschach effect. Steinkamp counts the late artist Jackson Pollock as a huge influence because of the illusion of movement in his paintings. But unlike traditional two-dimensional artwork, virtual art offers viewers a truly immersive experience. One thing that I like people to realize is that they can interact with it or they can play in the piece. And a lot of times people don't do that. And it's, it's frustrating. Little kids know instantly. They'll run in there, even dogs know. They'll run in there and play with their shadows and you know, um, Sometimes what will happen, because there will be double projectors overlapping on each other, your, your shadow will become integrated into the piece. Steinkamp's work is exhibited at museums and art galleries around the country. And while it's still considered a relatively experimental art form, interest is growing. One recent Steinkamp display created a stir when several patrons admitted that viewing the piece made them feel seasick. <laughs> well, it was great to get a physical response out of something that's not physical, um, be light projected onto a floor. And what happened was the, the architecture of the space or the floor becomes dematerialized as the light kind of takes over and, and creates its own dimension. And so as people watched this floor kind of undulating in and out, they you know, felt <laughs> sick, I guess. I, I never had that experience. In fact, I never experience my work the same way other people do, which is sort of disappointing. Maybe someday I will, I guess. Steinkamp creates her virtual art on a computer, but it's actually exhibited by laser disc on a video projector. Now her mind is bubbling with ideas for interactive pieces that would utilize computers as part of the display process. There's a piece I'm working on right now that, um, based on how many people are in the room, the the animation will re respond differently. So maybe when there's one person in the room, um, the piece will sort of devour them, or I suppose suck in. Uh, if there's many people in the room, I was thinking maybe it would spin around. I, you know, it's, it's work in progress, though. So it could go any direction right now. Whatever direction Steinkamp chooses to take, it's safe to assume it'll be far from conventional. <laughs> Coming up, the poltergeists have returned to haunt us, this time on TV. Do not stray from this frequency. This is Jeffrey Middleton from Moorhead, Kentucky, and I want to tell you about Ripper from Take-Two Interactive. This new game concerns the return of Jack the Ripper in the 21st century. You as a private investigator, must find out how he has come back and must stop him before he gets his next victim, you. This brand new six CD horror features Christopher Walken, Karen Allen, and Burgess Meredith and the rest of an all-star cast as you try and find out why Jack the Ripper has returned. They're back. Only this time, those pesky poltergeists are working their mischief on television in the new Showtime series, Poltergeist, The Legacy. The two-hour premiere arrives April 21st. You wouldn't remember me from the funeral, but I remember you and them. How long do you plan on staying? Pardon? The show's title will lead many into thinking that Poltergeist, The Legacy, is a spin-off of the 1980s movie trilogy. But series creator Richard Lewis says he shot down that idea when MGM first approached him about doing the show. You see, MGM owns the films and wanted to exploit the title on the small screen. When we were asked to do Poltergeist, I said, well, how do you do this as a series? Every week, Joe Beth Williams and Craig G. Nelson move into another house, and really bad things happen. So then they move into condominium. and <laughs> So Lewis hatched a new premise. The series centers around a secret society devoted to investigating and battling paranormal phenomena. 
To research the subject, Lewis had to go no further than his own niece, who had seen a ghost in the house her parents were renting. And when I went to the house to visit them, I was sort of getting chills just thinking about it. It was really unnerving to be in this place. There's something going on. There was cold spots. There's all those kind of things you see and you hear about where people sort of, you know, um, uh, go fantastic on what ghosts are. This is like the beginning of the, um, the body for the other shot, okay. where it rises about a frame. So to create the ghosts on his series, Lewis turned to the visual effects company Vision Arts. For the premiere episode, Vision Arts unleashed a nasty bunch of computer-generated poltergeists that resemble human skeletons. They've come up with something here at this group uh, we call Skeleton Man, who is the demon. Uh, because to me, I've, I've seen Casper, I've seen uh, uh, Lucas and Spielberg on Raiders did an incredible thing with the ghost flying around. I've sort of seen that, and I started to think, what, what would be more interesting? To find out how scary these poltergeists are, we went to one of the effects maestros who designed them, director of effects, Elan Soltis. It's going to be in your face from the beginning of the show right to the end, which is quite different from normal. On Richard Lewis's other series, The Revamped Outer Limits, they use between 65 and 70 visual effects per show. There will be over 200 in the first episode of Poltergeist. We had Elon Soltis and production exec Josh Rose point blank with the big question. Just how much gore are they going to sling at us? Well, I think overall, I mean, overall, I think it's, I don't know. Um, there's some nasty sequences. This is the first project I've ever worked on that my son won't see. The birth sequence is, um, is pretty insane. And my employees that have, have put it up and have watched it while we're working in shots around it have been, people don't know what to expect. And when they walk out of the room, everybody has the same look on their face. And I think the viewers are going to feel that. In future episodes, the protagonists will go on the offensive against demons, vampires, werewolves, and witches, in addition to poltergeists. It's kind of like Ghostbusters, only this time, they're not going for your funny bone, but your throat. <laughs> The World of Tomorrow, 1950s style, on Rocky Jones Space Ranger. Wait one for retro. This is Rocky Jones in the Space Ranger ship Orbit Jet to Ophetius. Rocky Jones. The 1950s was the heyday of TV space operas. The earliest of them were produced live and as a result were technically limited. Rocky Jones Space Ranger was the first space opera shot on film with what were then sophisticated production techniques. Since only 39 episodes were made, the series has been largely forgotten. But thanks to home video, it's possible to once again journey with Rocky and company through their black and white universe. Boy, if we could get them back on Earth for a while, they'd come to their senses quick enough. Hey, maybe we could figure out a way to... We go by the rule of freedom and a man's right to make his own decisions. The 1954 series focused on a crew of enforcers for a federation called the United Worlds. In addition to Commander Rocky Jones, the group usually included Professor Newton, co-pilot Winky, blonde babe navigator Vina, and prepubescent Bobby. The steel-jawed hero, Rocky, was an explorer, soldier, diplomat, and a bit of a chauvinist. Can't I go? It's out of the question. Why? Would that make it an invasion? No, but it's not a picnic either. I don't like picnics. What I mean is a flight like this is no place for a girl. The crew navigated outer space in a needle-nosed orbit jet. Though the special effects seem pretty hokey by today's standards, they were quite advanced for 50s television. The producers made the limited budget look less limited through their clever use of locations. For instance, an L.A. power station doubled for Rocky's landing facility. The tight budget also meant that all aliens had to be humanoid. Naturally, the aliens usually spoke English, even among themselves. Our little prince is just strengthening his voice, so someday he may rule his people. I wonder if Rocky Jones will find our gypsy moons again. Wait a minute, isn't that a German accent? Rocky Jones' space ranger reflected the Cold War paranoia of the 50s. The villains usually behave just like the commies that most Americans believe were insidiously infiltrating our society. 
For example, the Ophetians used brainwashing to turn the good guys into emotionless robots, just as it was thought the Reds were doing. You may change your mind, Bobby. Rocky Jones Space Ranger bit the dust because at 25 grand per episode, it didn't turn a profit. Fortunately, it has survived the ravages of time to remind us what the future looked like 40 years ago. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Dave, you going to be all right? No. Poor brave Dave here. He's so upset. He just got the news that Han Solo doesn't remember any Wookiee. You see, recently, Harrison Ford was named Man of the Year by the Harvard uh, University Hasty Pudding Theatricals. And at the ceremony, when they gave him the award, somebody asked him to translate Chewbacca's, you know, grunts and groans. And Harrison Ford said, I can't do it. I mean, I don't remember the language. I don't remember the language, is what he said. And Chewbacca of course, is Dave's favorite character on Star Wars. Oh, good, you're here. Our sci-fi buzz psychologist has arrived. We have to take a break now. We'll see you next week. Now stay tuned for Inside Space, next on the Sci-Fi Channel.